Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you very much for this great honor. Uh, Herman Weil is somebody that means a lot to, to me and to many people here. Uh, sorry? Louder. Louder. Yeah, so I'm saying that Herman Weil is somebody that meet, uh, means a lot to me and, and, of course, to many people here. Uh, so uh, I'll try, indeed, to give a general presentation, at least this lecture and part of uh, tomorrow. Uh, and then maybe I'll do something uh, more new in the last lecture. So, uh, so uh, let me start by saying that I will be talking about uh, a special case of general relativity, which is uh, Einstein equations in vacuum, which I'll write it like this, Einstein vacuum equations. So, uh, so this refers to solutions, which are space-times, and, and <coughs> everything for me is going to be a Lorentzian metric in four dimensions. And uh, the equations are the, the Ricci. So it's very simple to write down and very difficult to solve. It's, a, it's the shortest equation I can think of. Ricci of g is equal to 0. Uh, so uh, of course, this is uh, the, the general theory of relativity, of course, involves also matter, in which case you have the so-called Einstein uh, field equations. But maybe I, I'd like to say that this is already, from a mathematical point of view, hard enough. And also, uh, physically, it represents the theory of gravitational waves. So for example, all the detecting of gravitational waves that you heard about is really uh, just about the Einstein vacuum equations. Okay, Einstein vacuum equations. And I, I should say a little bit more. Uh, so. Uh, the first observation that you make about the Einstein equations, it's not so easy, but, uh, but uh, you can formalize it, is that these equations are hyperbolic. So in fact, uh, the easiest way to see that they are hyperbolic is to write down the so-called wave coordinates, x alpha. Uh, there are special coordinates relative to which uh, the system of equations become become a system of nonlinear wave equation, then, then the hyperbolicity is automatic. Okay? But of course, this is, gauge, <coughs> this is coordinate dependent. And of course, whenever you talk about the Einstein equations, you, you should remember that a solution, which is a metric in this case, is only defined up to the diffeomorphism. So uh, I complete, we completely identify g with uh, phi star of g, where phi is any diffeomorphism from m to m. Right? So, uh, so a solution is really a class of equivalence of solutions, which uh, is one of the reasons why the equations are relatively difficult to, to uh, deal with. Uh, but right now, I mean, now we do have a lot of, a lot of uh, methods to deal with this uh, coordinate difference. But you'll see that you'll play a major role in all my lectures. Uh, OK, so that's uh, the first <coughs> remark. Once you, you realize that these equations are hyperbolic, you, you can set up an initial value problem. So initial value problem is like in the simplest case of ordinary differential equations, you set up uh, uh, the position and the velocity. Uh, here, uh, also if you have a wave equations, you set up a time t equals 0. You set up the solution and the time derivative of solution. Here, you, you uh, the setting. <coughs> is a little bit more difficult, but not too much. And it's now very well understood. So you start with a three-dimensional manifold uh, and a Riemannian metric and uh, a two tensor, which is a second fundamental form. So th there is a triplet, and it verifies the so-called constraint equations. And constraint equations are by themselves sufficiently interesting, and there is a lot of, a lot of mathematics which deals just with the constraint equations. But I will not talk about the constraint equations. I will assume that we know how to solve the constraint equations. And I will be interested in starting with an initial data set and look at developments. So these are so-called Cauchy developments of, uh, <coughs> of initial data sets. And uh, that allows you to construct a space-time, in other words, uh, a, a solution, or th uh, this type of solutions of the Einstein equations, right? So, uh, so this is sort of the simplest thing that uh, you can say. Uh, and then, well, obviously, these things are important, but you, know, you, you really want to understand. Uh, and by the way, I should say that there is, we, we have also a local existence result, uh, which uh, 
uh, associates to any initial data set which satisfies the constraint equations, uh, associates a development, a unique development, but which is local. So this is sort of <coughs> an old result of Yvonne choquet brua from uh, the 1950s. So this is 1952. So, uh, so we know how to solve the problem in, uh, <coughs> in, uh, locally, uh, but we are interested in sort of the global behavior of solutions. In particular, we are interested in black holes. And uh, first thing that I could say about black holes, but maybe more generally, I could say one is interested whenever you have a nonlinear equation, it's not just this, you are interested in stationary states, stationary solutions. <laughs> In other words, some kind of solutions which do not d evolve in time, right? So they don't change in time. Now, of course, in general relativity, the notion of time is a little bit problematic. But uh, nevertheless, we'll see that it is a very simple way of making sense of uh, stationarity. So you look at stationary solutions, and you find out, uh, oh, by the way, there is one more thing that I, I should have said. I'm only, I should be interested in, in, uh, in what I'm talking about here, only uh, about uh, initial data sets which are asymptotically flat. So this asymptotic flatness is something very easy to define. In uh, sigma 3 is going to look at infinity, so outside the sufficiently large compact set is going to look like an uh, R3. And uh, the matrix here, this is going to become more and more Euclidean, right? So it's going to look more and more like Euclidean metric, the standard metric that uh, we know for Euclidean geometry. And the second fundamental form is going to become zero, right? So it's something that really uh, physically, these are called isolated systems. And it's in that context of asymptotic flatness that all these experiments, uh, gravitational wave experiments, were done. Right? So, so this is sort of the, uh, uh, sort of a very important assumption that I'm going to make. And uh, so these stationary solutions that I'm looking for are going to be also asymptotically flat. And uh, here, the remarkable thing which was discovered, uh, first of all, in 1915 by Schwarzschild, and later on, uh, my, much later actually, in, I think it was 1963, if I remember correctly, by Kerr. So this was Schwarzschild. Uh, so Kerr uh, gives you a, a, a family of solutions, which I'm going to refer to as Kerr AM, depending on two parameters, uh, A and M. A stands for angular momentum, so this will be black holes which rotates, and M stands for the mass. And uh, there are some, in, <coughs> to make I will make this kind of assumptions that uh, absolute value of A is much less than M, which has something to do with the fact that uh, these black holes are not extreme. The extreme case would be A equal to M, and if A is larger than M, then this becomes non-physical. There are uh, violations of cosmic censorship that will... Uh, okay, so in any case, th this is a context in which uh, my lectures will take place. So now let me go to uh, one sort of big conjecture just to set up the the, uh, you know, the kind of things that we are interested in. So uh, this is sort of the biggest conjecture that you can make, right? Which is called the final state conjecture. And it says that uh, the long time behavior of generic asymptotically flat. Now generic is a notion that you'll have to define, you know, probably when you prove it, you'll also know what generic <laughs> means. Uh, but roughly it, it, it says that essentially all solutions with some exceptions are, which are asymptotically flat, uh, Einstein vacuum equations we already discussed, is given by the super, superposition of a finite number of diverging Kerr black holes. So in other words, in any region of space, in any finite region of space, you eventually you'll see only one Kerr solution or nothing at all. Uh, and uh, and uh, plus a radiative decaying term, this is these are just gravitational waves. Right, so th this is uh, these are gravitational waves, and these are exactly the, the sort of thing that that these gravitational wave detectors, the LIGO, detects. Uh, and uh, uh, well, this is uh, uh, when I say superposition. Of course, you, you have to think about the nonlinear. This is a nonlinear equation, so superposition usually it's understood linearly. Here, of course, the superposition also uh, presupposes that uh, that uh, you really have to uh, sort of understand what you are talking about, right? But anyway, this is roughly the, this is roughly uh, the uh, biggest conjecture that you can make. And of course, there are similar conjectures that you can make for other PDs. I mean, this is not just typical to Einstein equations. You, uh, you know, there, there are certain uh, 
similar conjectures you can make for other important equations. When does diverging I'm sorry? When does diverging mean diverging? Diverging, diverging. So they are <laughs> going away. So I, I, I'll say more about this in a second. Okay? So th what you are going to get to see asymptotically in any regional state, I will see either one case solution or, uh, and in any case, a finite number in total. So uh, now, uh, so uh, the final state conjugation is incredibly complicated. And of course, I don't know, we are maybe, I don't know, hundreds of years away, or maybe, I don't know, who knows? Maybe some young people here so might prove to solve. <laughs> to s well, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, whatever. <laughs> right. So, uh, so the problem, the, 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 but the problem, of course, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, you, you can think of it as a combination of smaller problems, each one of them being by itself a huge problem, right? So, for example, the simplest thing that you might be interested in is what happens if you make. By the way, I, I forgot to say, of course, that the, the simplest solution here, which is part of this family, when a is equal m equal to zero, is just a Minkowski space. So this is a standard space of spatial relativity. Right? Uh, yeah, the Schwarzschild is a case when a is equal to zero. So a equal to zero is exactly Schwarzschild. Right? So. Uh, uh, so the simplest thing that uh, uh, you might be interested in is, is if you take small perturbations of because in other words, you take initial data which are who have relatively small energy, okay, whatever that means. Of course, you have to again you have to identify that notion, but uh, in that case, you expect that uh, solutions don't concentrate. So the only thing you are going to see are gravitational waves going away to infinity. There are no the, the Instead of having a finite number of care solutions, you have just zero care solutions and, and gravitational waves. So this is stability of Minkowski space. Okay, now if you, if you start taking data larger, then you might have concentration, and this is a problem of collapse. In other words, large, large data may concentrate into stationary states, which are black holes. Uh, all stationary states are care solutions. So, okay, so this is a, sort of a, an, a, an interesting remark about this. We have a family of solutions, which are uh, these two-parameter family. How do we know that these are the only stationary solutions, right? Now, stationary solutions are, of course, in immensely important from the perspective of, uh, of cosmic, of, uh, sorry, of uh, finite state, because uh, the justification, the only justification that we have about the finite state conjecture is that somehow radiation moves away, goes away to infinity, or goes away inside black holes. <coughs> Right? So uh, after a while, the only thing you are going to see are stationary states, and the stationary states, according to the rigidity, this rigidity conjecture, will have to be, will have to be care solutions. Right? So, so in your slide, yes. Oh, so this is, this is the theorem. This is the only one uh, the that answer. we know. <laughs> well, uh, we are, we have results, of course, about the other ones you'll see. But but in terms of uh, in terms of complete understanding. I would say only stability of Minkowski. Even stability of Minkowski space, you could ask other questions. Right. Anyway, so this is the result of Christo Dulo and myself the from rigidity, about 25 years ago. Rigidity, the classification of rigid solution, uh, stationary solutions is known now? Well, th this is one thing I'll discuss today, so you'll see. Right? Uh, okay, so rigidity, care solutions are stable. So this is an issue of stability, right? So the, the, you, you have solutions which correspond exactly to this care solution. So in other words, you can pick up the initial data, exactly the initial data of the care solution. You make a small perturbation, what happens? If, it's, if somehow small perturbations lead to something entirely different, then of course care solutions are, are not real, are not physically real. They are mathematical artifacts. They are very beautiful mathematical artifacts. We can write down the solutions explicitly, but physically they don't make any sense unless they, have this, they, they satisfy this uh, stability condition. Uh, then there are many other things that you'd have to understand before understanding the whole thing. For example, cosmic censorship conjecture, the fact that there are no singular, this is a, a global regularity conjecture, the fact that there are no singularities outside black holes, right? This is another major problem in general relativity. And uh, for the moment, the only thing we know is a spherical symmetric case due to uh, Dimitrios Christodoulou. Uh, there are, uh, then two and more body problem, which means basically 
you, you may have two solutions, which are two care solutions initially somehow. Of course, superposing two, <laughs> two uh, initial states which are look like care solutions is, is a, a difficult problem of the constraint equations. But anyway, once you assume that you have something like that, then you want to study the evolution. So now what could happen is, of course, that the, the care solutions could diverge, so they go to infinity, or they can merge. Right? So, for example, all these uh, recent gravitational wave experiments were based on merging of two solutions. Two solutions are very close, they merge, and uh, when they merge, they produce a huge amount of gravitational waves, and these are the ones which are being detected. All right, so, uh, so the cosmic energy is a huge thing, and the, uh, one can also talk about uh, smaller problems associated to this, but that's not uh, my goal today. So... Uh, uh, I should say that from a mathematical point of view, so there is a lot of numerical analysis uh, connected to this, uh, this merging of black holes, but from a mathematical point of view, I don't think we have anything. Right. Right. So, uh, so it, th this is uh, sort of a smaller problem connected with, uh, with final state, which is the problem of gravitational collapse, which is that uh, large energy concentration, as I said before, can lead to the formation of a dynamical black hole, which settles down uh, by gravitational radiation to a care black hole. This is the kind of picture that you get. You have, uh, you have uh, matter. Well, in, in this case, I'm talking about Einstein equations in vacuum. So instead of even thinking about matter, you can just think about gravitational waves. So a lot of gravitational waves which concentrate and produce uh, a black hole. I'll say more about this later on. So uh, for the moment, I want to separate these three issues, uh, which we had on the, on the previous slides, and uh, which also are obviously relevant to the picture here. Namely, the problem of collapse. Can black holes form in the first place? Right? Second, uh, in other words, forming from uh, in the first place means starting with regular configurations, regular configurations which don't have black holes, right? Whatever that means, you have to make that precise, of course. Uh, all stationary states are care black holes, so this is a problem of rigidity, right, which I mentioned. So in other words, uh, there could be many other stationary states, we don't know. So, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, it does work. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the problem of stability, right? So I like to call these problems as uh, problems of reality of black holes, because, again, if... Uh, so uh, reality in the sense of uh, sort of mathematical tests of reality. So can, uh, I think what everybody will agree that these are tests of the theory of black holes. And if any one of them is false, then uh, the picture, which is the, you know, the, the standard picture of gravitational collapse, or the standard picture of the final state, and so on, is false. Right? Right, so that's, that's nice, because you, you, know, you can now do mathematics. Yes? Well, that's uh, another matter here, which I'm not, I'm not going to address now, but uh, we can discuss in, in, in private. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, th so there, there is no symmetry. I mean, once you, once you get the black hole, there is no way to reverse the black hole. So there is, there, there is uh, in a sense, the, the situation where time is irreversible uh, inside black holes. Okay, so let's, let's, let me now talk about uh, uh, what is a black hole. So uh, uh, it's a solution, as I said, of the, so the uh, solution of the Einstein equation, which is stationary. And sta stationarity means now the following thing. There, is, there exists a Killing vector field, which is time-like, but not necessarily everywhere. It's asymptotically time-like. In other words, as you go towards infinity, it, it, as you go towards the region of the space-time, where the space-time is close to being Minkowski, uh, you, the vector field is time-like, and uh, uh, we'll see that it's not necessarily time-like everywhere, but in any case, uh, this condition is the, the one that defines stationarity. So the linear derivative with respect to the metric T of G is equal to zero. So there is a very simple way of defining stationarity. Then there are some other assumptions that you want to make. It has to be asymptotically flat. Globally hyperbolic means that somehow you have a completeness like a Riemannian geometry. You cannot take points away from the space-time. Uh, there, is a, there is another condition here, uh, which is the fact that it's diffeomorphic to the complement of a cylinder. This has to do with the fact that I'm looking only at the external part of the black hole. I'm only interested what happens outside. 
so I said globally hyperbolic in, in some sense. I, I don't want to get into the details, but means roughly. Well, globally hyperbolic means that it, it can be developed by uh, looking at the initial data. So you you can you you can uh, construct solutions based on the initial data. But here, take it as just meaning that you. you no, the global hyperbolicity is connected with hyperbolic equations, but it's it's a it's definition. It means the well it's connected to the well poisonedness of the Cauchy product. The definition is, anyway, let me not get into the precise definition. Think of it as being some kind of completeness, right? There are no points. You cannot take points away, right? Just like in Riemannian geometry. So some kind of completeness. Uh, there is another uh, notion of completeness, which is that of the null infinity. So this is uh, somehow, uh, again, something that maybe I don't want to get into details right now. Maybe I'll say a few words later. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, this is the definition. And then uh, you can talk about the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, and again, I'll leave this for a little bit later, because I, I, I want to talk it on, on a particular example. <coughs> so the particular example, of course, is the Kerr family. So Kerr is the simplest example of a stationary, well, the simplest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, it, it's, uh, it's a, a precise family of solutions depending on two parameters, which are stationary. So let you can, uh, so let's see, this is a metric. There are some coefficients of the metric which are expressed in terms of this formula here, right? Uh, and stationarity simply means that if I look at all the coefficients, they don't depend on time, right? So uh, this doesn't depend on time, this doesn't depend on time, and so on and so forth. So that's very simple uh, to check. Uh, the fact that they are asymptotically flat m simply means that uh, this metric becomes a Minkowskian metric as I let r go to infinity. So r is uh, one of the coordinates. Uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> well, the only other thing that I should say is that uh, among, among this class of solutions, you also have the Schwarzschild solution, which is a little bit easier. So the Schwarzschild solution is spherically symmetric. So this is the line element of the sphere. And uh, this delta is 1 minus 2 m over r. And uh, delta over r squared is 1 minus 2 over r. In general, you have delta is r squared minus a squared minus 2 m over r. The, the precise formula is not very relevant. We'll see that actually a lot of advances in the, the mathematical theory of black holes have to do with the fact that uh, you, know, you forget about the, the specific coordinates. right? What's important to remember is that, uh, uh, well, it's it's uh, stationary and axisymmetric, and uh, and the fact that it it can be expressed in a simpler picture, which is a typical Penrose Penrose diagram picture, in which uh, so here is how you represent it. Uh, there are two values of r. The, the important thing here r plays a very important role in this picture. So there is a, a value of r which corresponds to uh, delta of r equal to zero. That's a, the, the, mi the minimal uh, root of uh, delta. Remember, delta is r squared plus a squared minus 2mr. Uh, and uh, uh, the second r plus, which is here. So r minus <laughs> represents this uh, line here in this picture. r plus represents, uh, re sorry, r plus represents this one. Here, this line here represents r equal infinity. So this is uh, what, what we call uh, the uh, null infinity, right? So r equal to infinity. So this, this, you have to think about it as some kind of com com formal compactification, uh, where essentially every point on this line represents the endpoint of a null geodesic. Now, the geodesic, again, the geodesic in this picture, the null geodesic being the most important one, uh, uh, they are represented at 45 degrees in this picture. So, for example, this one here is a uh, uh, null hypersurface consisting uh, of uh, null geodesics. And uh, uh, you, see, you see the black hole, the, you see the black region here, which represents a black hole, the true black hole, which is separated by, uh, which is separated from, from the rest, which is the external region of the black hole is separated by uh, this event horizon. So event horizon is exactly this r equal r plus in, uh, in this special case. Uh, there are two regions like this. Of course, from a physical point of view, are interested in, in just one, just the external region. And of course, the external region looks more and more Minkowskian. So here, 
you are essentially uh, like in Minkowski space, right? So that's the kind of uh, picture that is relevant. So if you, if you think about the care solution, whenever we think about care solution, that's what we think about. Now, they, the, the interior of the black hole is also very interesting, and there is a lot to be said, but I'm not going to say because Michalis uh, and uh, Jonathan Luke have just proved a very interesting result about, about uh, the internal part. But I, I will, uh, uh, essentially everything I will say today and in the next lectures is about the external part. So I'm interested, I'm interested in going all the way to the black hole, but not going inside, right? Okay, so uh, here is again the external part of the black hole, which is represented here. Yes, Would sorry? The red line, the, the red curve? Uh, oh yeah, so thi this represents a, a Cauchy hypersurface. So for example, I can set up the initial data on that uh, on that hypersurface, right? Okay. So, I mean, this is, I mean, it, well, th this also has to do with this maximal global hyperbolic development because the ma maximal global hyperbolic development is represented by this picture. In fact, the space time can actually be continued, and this is uh, sort of something that Michalis and, and, and Luke have recently uh, have recently studied. Anyway, but I, I will not go. I will not talk a lot at all about the inside. So uh, if I'm interested about Cauchy data, initial value problems, I would be interested in this red line. All right. We're not interested, you're not going to talk about the red line in the shaded area. So I'm not interested in this part, yes. Right. All right. Uh, okay, so here is uh, the external care. So again, I'm interested in the external part of the care solution. Uh, T represents this time like uh, killing vector field, uh, which defines stationarity. And uh, you see T is at 90 degrees. That corresponds to well, what you think about time. Uh, but of course, as you approach the, uh, the event horizon, which is this one here, event, the event horizon, by the way, is a null hypersurface, which is represented by the fact here that the null cone at points on the null hypersurface are tangent to the null hypersurface, right? Which is, of course, as you see uh, here, you have uh, T points in the interior, while uh, uh, close to the uh, null hypersurface, so close to this event horizon, T becomes space-like, right? So this is one big uh, complication that you have with the care solution, that the stationary vector field, uh, which is time-like uh, at infinity, actually becomes uh, space-like, and that creates lots of problems, okay? Because time has, uh, th this time-like any vector field has something to do with energy. And uh, which would mean, roughly speaking, that uh, you don't have, uh, you have positive energy in this region, but you have, you'll have negative regions, uh, negative regions of energy, which creates uh, both physical and, and mathematical uh, complications. All right, so here are other, other properties of care which will play a role. Uh, for example, so it has two killing vector fields, T and Z, right? So T corresponds to stationarity, Z corresponds to axial symmetry. So they are both very important. And uh, uh, in addition, there is another symmetry, which is, uh, was discovered by Carter in the 70s, which also plays a very important role in the theory, and that's called the Carter tensor. So this is actually, instead of being a vector field, it's a tensor. It's a, it's a symmetric, traceless tensor, which is called the Keeling tensor. Uh, I will, uh, I, I'm not going to get into this. I, I just want to mention that uh, there are other important things. This is actually something that I will need uh, in the second lecture, second and third lecture. It possesses two distinct principal null directions. So let me, let me say a few words about this. So what that means is that at every point, so every point on care, uh, I can identify two directions uh, which are null. So there is, a, a ve there is a direction, so in other words, a vector, which I call E4, and another one which I call E3. E4 is null. What that means is that G, so this, this is a vector, so I, I can apply the metric to the vector, so I get this equal to 0. The same thing about E3, right? So this, this means that the two are null vectors. And uh, you can also uh, maybe normalize them uh, to make them equal to minus 2. And I call this a null pair, right? So th this is something that uh, <coughs> will play a role uh, in my second lecture. But for the moment, let me just uh, simply say that care has two such, in every point, has two such vector fields, which are called principal null directions. So what principal null direction means is that if I look at the curvature, so the Riemann curvature tensor, and I apply it to uh, 
all components. So I can add two more components here so that I have a frame. So this is, uh, again, I'm in, 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 uh, in one plus three dimensions. So I'm going to have a, at every point, I have these two plus two more, which will give me a, a, a natural frame. And uh, in this frame, all components of the curvature are zero except two components, right? So that's sort of a principle of analysis. It's something very special and extremely important. And uh, as I said, it will play an important role in what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. OK, so for the moment, another, another thing which I, uh, I'll, I'll mention later uh, as being important in, in what I say later is that uh, CAD also can be distinguished among all stationary solutions. So I take all stationary solutions of the Einstein equation, Einstein vacuum equations, right? So they are defined, any stationary solution is defined by a vector field, which is killing. And uh, I can construct a, a tensor, which is called the Mars-Simon tensor. So this is a, a complex tensor. So it's uh, S, which is formed roughly by the curvature, Riemann curvature tensor, and something which comes from the Killing vector field. In fact, it's a derivative of the Killing vector field. So it's some kind of uh, interesting combination of these two. I'm not going to write it explicitly what it is. The important thing is that uh, you get a tensor, which is a complex tensor, which is exactly zero in care. But moreover, any stationary solution for which uh, this is zero has to be a care solution locally at every point. So in a sense, this is like the Riemann curvature tensor in Riemannian geometry. The Riemann curvature tensor identifies the, the Euclidean space, right? Identifies the, the, the uh, trivial uh, space. So the same thing here, the mass Simon tensor identifies a care solution. All right, so now, uh, okay, so let's go back to this uh, discussion about rigidity, stability, and collapse. So again, these are, I call them tests of reality of uh, black holes. First one, again, does a care family exhaust all possible vacuum black holes? Stability is a care family stable under arbitrary small perturbation, which so I mentioned earlier. And collapse, can black holes form starting from reasonably initial data, data configurations? And this is connected to something which I'll define later, which is the formation of trap surfaces. All these problems can be viewed from in the context of the initial value formulation that I discussed earlier, uh, where you start with an initial data set, sigma 0, g0, and k0. So this is, uh, has to ver verify the constraint equations. It's space-like, so space-like hypersurface, when I embed it in a development of the space-time. So the, the result of Yvonne Chocobriar in 1952, Loray also. Loray is actually the one who, de who defined uh, global hyperbolicity. So, and it was in connection with exactly this. And in fact, he was here at the Institute, I think, at the time when he gave lectures, at least. I don't know if, he, if that's when he did it, but I, I know that he, he gave a, a, a set of very famous uh, lecture notes at the Institute. I think it was 1949 or 1948 or 49. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is a initial value problem. Uh, so of course, uh, stability, you, you want to understand in terms of taking initial conditions, which are exactly care, and you want to perturb it a little bit. Uh, the issue of collapse, the same thing. You, you want to take initial data, which are free of black holes, and you want to understand how black holes can form. So uh, let's, start, let's start with the rigidity conjecture. So what I'll do next is discuss a little bit about the rigidity. And then if I have time, I'll talk about collapse and uh, stability. I'm sure I will not have time today. Right, so let, let's, uh, uh, rigidity conjecture is uh, true. So the first result that we have is that uh, if you have a stationary solution, asymptotically flat, all the conditions that I talked about, and in addition, it's axially symmetric, then it has to be care, right? Does that come down to a differential equation? No, it comes up to partial differential equation. It comes up to nonlinear. It comes up to, to uh, harmonic maps, essentially. It's a, it's a unique, it's a rigidity result for harmonic maps with interesting boundary conditions, right? So because you have to put boundary conditions at infinity and other boundary conditions at, uh, on the axis. Anyway, so because you, you have the axis of symmetry given by the ax uh, axial uh, symmetric condition. Question. Yes? When you speak of rigidity of care, you go to data you given outside the black hole and back to uh, Yeah, so everything I'm going to say now is outside the black hole. So I'm only interested up to the black hole. Uh, so, uh, okay, so the, here is a, another result, which is due to Hawking, which is, says that uh, if you have analyticity, in other words, if the metric is also analytic, in addition to being stationary, then it has to be 
It has to be the Kerr solution. And this result goes like this. I mean, the, the proof of Hawking, it's kind of a, sorry? Analyticity here. Everything is outside, right? You see, I mean, these are causal, causal domains, so you don't have to you don't have to worry at all, at all about what happens inside. It's a, it's no a boundary, no boundary behavior. No boundary behavior, right? It's it, it's just a space time, which is a regular a regular black hole in the sense I defined before. Then uh, okay, but don't get so excited because this is <laughs> this, this is a terrible result. <laughs> this is a terrible result actually because. <laughs> Because uh, it's a cheat result, because <laughs> analyticity makes no sense. First of all, analyticity doesn't make any sense in the context of hyperbolic equations, because you, you have to talk about domain causality, domains of dependence. Uh, analyticity <coughs> should have nothing to do with the theory of general relativity. However, you can make, I mean, I, I, you, 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 you can give him some credit, because, <laughs> because uh, at least, you see, well, wherever. Yeah, right. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere, everywhere where t is time-like, everywhere t is time-like, right? You can you can uh, you can write down the Einstein equations. You make the assumptions of, of uh, the fact that you have a killing vector field, which is time-like. You get a system of elliptic equations. So analyticity is of course automatically satisfied. So in all regions where t is time-like, this is true. I mean, the, his assumption was reasonable. Where it's totally unreasonable is what happens here inside near, near, it's called the ergo region, the region where uh, T becomes actually space-like. And uh, then, of course, the equations are hyperbolic. There is nothing uh, you can say about uh, anymore. So th in that sense, I, I call it some kind of cheat result. But still, it's not totally cheating, because if you are interested in, in analytic, so if, you are, if you want to classify all analytic solutions, it still gives you an interesting result. Right? Right? In other words, all explicit solutions, if you want. <laughs> Solution has to be a care solution. So in that sense, is is a very good one. So uh, anyway, so I already made the point. This is not a reasonable assumption. Uh, okay. So what are reasonable assumptions? Of course, reasonable assumption is to talk in the class of smooth solutions where we have causality and everything else. Uh, so here are some results that uh, that uh, my colleague Ionescu uh, and I have. Uh, but we started to work on this problem uh, about I don't know ten years ago almost, right? It's ten years ago, we had the first result which was that, uh, uh, that uh, the, result, the uh, conjecture is true if you make a certain assumption on the event horizon of the black hole, right? So, so again, you have a stationary solution, a general stationary solution, but we made a, uh, an assumption. Actually, the assumption was exactly that that mass Simon tensor was zero on the event horizon. In fact, even less. We all, all, in, all we needed is that S was zero exactly at this corner, right, at the intersection of these two. Uh, uh, two horizons. Uh, okay, so that's uh, one result. Another result, which maybe is more interesting, uh, is that it's true if it's close to a Kerr spacetime. So this is sort of a result which says that if I have a stationary solution, which is in some sense close to being Kerr, then it has to be Kerr, right? So it's a it's kind of a stability type result. Uh, and the smallness, what I mean by being sufficiently close to Kerr, is the fact that this mass Simon tensor is sufficiently small in a way which, again, has to be, has to be uh, quantized, I mean, has to be uh, so qualified. So it's all, so th these are not conditions on the initial data, right? These are, these are global uh, things. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, the other, okay, so these are two results that we know. Unfortunately, of course, we don't understand the whole picture. The whole picture would be to study, uh, to no, make no smallness assumption. Uh, but we do have a conjecture, however. <laughs> so, the conjecture, uh, which is uh, conjecture with Alexakis, uh, and myself, is that relativity conjecture holds true if there are no t trap null geodesics. So, w what does it mean? First of all, I think I forgot to tell you about uh, trap null geodesics. So, you see, in, in addition to the ergo region, which is the, ta the, the region of the exterior of the space time where t becomes space like, there is another bad region of, uh, of uh, uh, so called trapped null geodesics. So, what are these? These are null geodesics that don't go here. In other words, they don't go into the black hole. So if they go into the black hole, then you can forget about them. They are done, right? And if they go to infinity, you can also forget about them. They are done, right? But unfortunately, and you can always prove that such things exist, they must, ex they must also, and you don't see it in the picture because uh, this is a two-dimensional picture and, and uh, these kind of things are, are, are uh, four-dimensional. Uh, 
uh, there are other, there could be other null geodesics which stay in this region. So this, there, is, there is a region, for example, in Schwarzschild, it's exactly R equals 3M in Schwarzschild, right? In Kerr, it's a little bit more complicated, but there is always a, a limited region of uh, values of R for which you have such things. And they lead to all sorts of problems. And in particular, they lead to violations uh, of unique continuation. All these results that we have are based on unique continuation, Carleman estimates. Uh, convexity, in our convexity, as we call it, and uh, they they get into uh, uh, the obstruction, the natural obstruction for this null convexity are, are, uh, are uh, this null geodesy. However, because we are interested in stationary space time, right? So we were trying to solve the Einstein equations in the stationary re regime. It's not all trap null geodesics that are bad. Only the T trap null geodesics, which are the null geodesic perpendicular to the vector field T. So only, only those are relevant in this issue, right? And now uh, the remarkable thing, which I, I'll, I'll have it on my next slide, is that in CAD there are no such things. So there are plenty of, of trap geodesics, trap null geodesics, but no, no T-trap null geodesics, right? Okay, so, so the conjecture says that the, <laughs> the, if you don't have any T-trap null geodesics, then uh, there is no other obstruction. Uh, so I invite people to prove uh, their conjecture and also disprove it. I, I also, I personally believe that there are counterexamples to the rigidity theorem. In other words, such t trap null geodesics can exist. Of course, artificially, they will be very unstable. They will, you will produce space times which are very unstable, but I would not be surprised if there are, uh, if there are counterexamples. Anyway, let's, uh, let me go to a Can typical. Go back. This last statement was a theorem or a conjecture? This is, uh, as you, yeah, that's a conjecture. It's still a conjecture. It's still a conjecture. And what makes <laughs> So again, uh, null geodesics are trapped if they stay in this region. T-trap -trap means that they are also perpendicular to T, to this vector field T. Right? Okay. Right? So for example, there can be no such things in this region. In the region where T is, is, is time-like, there can be no such things. So this is something that really affects only this uh, bad region. All right, so uh, here is a typical example of, uh, of a result uh, that uh, one can prove in this context, and you can see some uh, a little bit more mathematics here. Uh, so here is a definition, O, uh, which is a domain on my manifold, is said to be null convex at the point P. So maybe I'll write it here. So I have, uh, I have some domain. I have a point P. And uh, I say that the, uh, this is null convex, so, th so this is the domain D. And I, I, let's say I have a, a killing vector field, which I, I call T. Uh, sorry, I call, uh, uh, so what did I call it? Uh, Z, right? So, so I have, a, this is O, and I have uh, a killing vector field in O. And I want to extend it past P. Now, if you have analyticity, you don't need any condition whatsoever. You can always extend killing vector fields without any problem. If you, have analyti if you don't have analyticity, however, you need a condition. And it, this, is called, uh, this is what we call the null convexity condition. So null convexity means that if I look at the defining function of the boundary, so I take f to be 0, the boundary, uh, then uh, uh, the Hessian in the direction of any null vector field in the tangent space at the boundary, right? So I'm looking only at, at the tangent space at the boundary, uh, has to be strictly negative whenever x is null. And t null convex, it means that I also, uh, this condition also has to be verified, right? So uh, the theorem is that if you have, a, which is again a the theorem is Ionescu and myself, is that if you have a Ricci flat pseudo Riemannian, you don't even have to have the Einstein equation, but uh, it, sorry, it doesn't have to be Lorentzian, but it ha has to satisfy, I guess I didn't say that. Ah, yeah, Ricci flat. So it has to be Ricci flat, so it still has to satisfy the Einstein equation, but the metric can be allowed to be more general. If you have a Keating vector field in O, right, which is uh, what I have here, and I want to extend it past uh, P, I can do it if this null convexity is verified. Right, so this is a very general result that tells you the importance of uh, of uh, null convexity. In fact, it's a strong null convexity because I, ha I need strict here. In fact, in the next slide, I'll show you a counterexample of what happens if you get zero here. Right? So they, this is a, the next thing. Uh, so this is a counterexample. And in, in fact, you can think of it as a counterexample to what Hawking wanted to do. Because uh, you, you can imagine having the Kerr solution 
So I have the care solution uh, everywhere, uh, but I, I want to replace, I want to take a point on this no event horizon, and I want to replace the care solution inside by another stationary solution of the Einstein equation, which coincides with this one, which is a care solution on, on, on the other side. And uh, this can be done locally around any such point because the null convexity is not verified here. So the null convexity fails exactly at points on, on the null hypersurface, okay? So whenever, uh, so null hypersurfaces are, uh, you can basically see there are violations of uh, null convexity. Uh, so here is an example of the fact that the problem is much harder than Hawking uh, envisioned. All right, so uh, rigidity, so very fast about what is the methodology which was used. We m measure closeness of care using the mass amount tensor. I mentioned that already. The rigidity, which is a uniqueness issue, is turned into an extension problem uh, using unique continuation arguments. This is, uh, I guess I, I went too fast about that. So uh, there are two ways of, of proving the results that I mentioned. One is to use <coughs> this mass Simon tensor and make certain assumptions about that. And that, the other one, which uh, is based on an observation of Hawking. But so I'm talking in general about uh, about uh, issues of uh, uniqueness of, of black holes. I mean, what, what I'm really interested in is uniqueness of black holes, right? So rigidity of black holes so as a global problem. But I can I can split it into a local problem and a global problem, right? Now uh, uh, there are two. Uh, what I wanted to say is that there are two ways of uh, dealing uh, with this the problem. One is to use a mass Simon tensor. And the other one is to uh, use an observation of Hawking, uh, which was used it actually in his analytic result, that, that, uh, that t, this vector field t, is tangent on the event horizon and induces a second killing vector field on the event horizon. So you can always uh, produce a second killing vector field. And then this second killing vector field has to be extended inside. And that's where analyticity was needed in what he was doing. And the extension, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the uniqueness result is turned into an extension result. In fact, this was done already by Hawking. But then in order to do it honestly, you need this unique continuation result uh, that I mentioned. So uh, uh, you need null convexity. So you, you need this notion of null convexity. This is a local result. Uh, you need this fact that, that null convexity is actually verified on the event horizon at these points, but not on these points, right? So in, in the, the, bifurcate, uh, the bifurcate horizon, so at the bifurcation sphere, uh, as it is called, the null convexity is verified. And uh, well, you have to use Kar Kalman estimates to prove these sort of things. And then uh, obstruction to extension is the presence of T-trap null geodesics, uh, which I mentioned. And the fact that there are no such things in care is an indication that maybe this is the right uh, type of conjecture. Right, so uh, problem of collapse. So I guess I have 10 more minutes, right? So, uh, so collapse can black holes from uh, starting from reasonably initial data configuration. So this is a problem uh, uh, which was uh, connect is a co connected with, with trap surfaces. But let me first re remind people very fast what is a, a trap surface. Uh, so this is a concept introduced by Penrose in connection to the so-called incompleteness theorem, or the singularity theorem, as some people call it. Uh, and uh, uh, let me not discuss this for a moment. Uh, maybe I'll come later. Uh, but let, let's discuss very fast the uh, Penrose singularity theorem. Let's recall what that, uh, what that says. So uh, it's an incompleteness result based on certain assumptions, so, uh, that which, which are that the Ricci uh, of the, the, the Ricci curvature of the metric G in any null direction, which is L, has to be large or equal to zero. In our case, where Ricci is equal to zero, this is automatically satisfied, right? Uh, M contains a non compact Cauchy hypersurface, right? So, uh, again, this is something very natural in the constant of asymptotic flatness, right? So, it's something uh, reasonable. Uh, 
And uh, the most important uh, assumption is, is that uh, M contains a closed trap surface. So what does a closed trap surface mean? Well, you, you start with the two surfaces. Imagine that you are in Minkowski space. If I'm in Minkowski space, the, at every point on S, I have two null geodesic, one which is moving towards infinity of the Minkowski space, and another one which moves inside. Right? So in other words, there, are, there is a divergence of the area uh, forms of these two surfaces along the outgoing null geodesics, and on the contrary, uh, the area is decreasing along the incoming ones, right? along the ones that go inside. A trap surface is one for which both these uh, uh, area elements in both directions are actually uh, converging. Right? So this is measure, uh, you can measure locally by uh, a quantity which is called expansion, which is a trace, so-called trace of si second fundamental form. This is something actually which will come up uh, in my next lecture. So it's, a, it's an expansion that measures locally these divergences. So right? it's a surface in the in, in data in yeah, any surface, any two surfaces. Yeah, it could be in particular, it could be on the initial data. So you can think of it as being on, it, on the initial data. Right, in fact, it's probably better to think of it because uh, you, you'd like to have a condition initially which will tell you uh, something bad happens uh, later on. All right, so if, if these three conditions are satisfied, then the space line has to be incomplete. Right? In other words, something bad happens uh, inside here. You don't know, the theorem doesn't tell you anything about what goes wrong, but you, uh, at least it tells you that something has to go wrong. Right? There, is, there is some kind of incompleteness. This is based on, uh, on some Riccati equation. Just like in Riemannian geometry, this type of results exist also in Riemannian geometry, and they, they are based on some Riccati equations, which, which are Riccati equations with the right-hand side, which has a right sign. Uh, and that happens in this case, the right sign of the Riccati equation is given by this condition. Okay? So this, this is all that is to it. It's a very simple result. It can, it can be proved by just looking, writing down what these equations are. Right? At every point, right? So at every point, the surface is, the area of the surface is decreased. By the way, this is important because, uh, of course, even in Minkowski space, I can take, if I take a surface like this, which is uh, convex, then obviously the area is, the outgoing null, hat, n n null directions, in, in the outgoing null directions, the area is increasing and decreasing this way. But of course, if I, if I take a dent in my hypersurface, then locally, the, hypersurface, the, the areas will also decrease. Right? So th this, is, this has to be a condition everywhere. And it is decreasing <coughs> infinitesimally for some finite time? Well, uh, all I'm interested in is what happens here on the two surfaces. It's just a condition. It's a local condition on the two surfaces. Right? It has to decrease there, and that's enough. And uh, and has absolutely nothing, uh, tells you nothing, right? So, okay, th this in fact is going to be my next slide. So the questions which are raised by, uh, by this uh, uh, incompleteness theorem is, well, how do you get trap surfaces in the first place? This is the first question, right? Which is the most natural one, because this is clearly, I mean, the condition of a trap surface is a very strong condition, right? Uh, can trap surfaces form starting with non-isotropic configurations? That's another sort of very reasonable question to ask. And of course, uh, what is the nature of singularities predicted by Penrose? It's another big question, and of course, I'm not going to address this. Right? So, uh, so here is a, uh, the first major result is due to Christodoulou in 2008, uh, who found an open set of regular vacuum data whose maximal global hyperbolic development right? So uh, uh, will have to contain a trap surface. So in other words, you want to start with the initial conditions. Well, his initial conditions are not taken on a space-like hypersurface. They are instead taken on a null hypersurface. Right? So this is a so-called characteristic initial value problem, which makes as much sense as a, as a uh, Cauchy problem. Right? So you can, you can set up initial conditions on such a space-like hypersurface. And what he did, he, he took something which is exactly Minkowski in, in this region, right? So this region here, so this represents the same thing. This region, you take exactly Minkowski space, and you, you, you look on this now hypersurface, which is here, and you, you take a short part, so you change the data from the trivial data of Minkowski space, you change it to something uh, more complicated, which is the so-called short pulse. And uh, he proved that under this characteristic initial data, he can 
so, and of course, uh, the important thing is, is to realize that you have to do two things. You, you have to make sure that there are no trap surfaces to start with, right? So in, in other words, the data cannot be too wild. But it has to be big enough to produce later on a trap surface. So this is not a small data result at all. It's very different from, in that sense, from stability of Minkowski space. There are no small data. Uh, so something else has to happen in order to allow you to construct a space time for a very long time, right? So, uh, so you, you, you can imagine that somehow uh, the initial data here uh, has some components which behave like delta. Delta is a parameter which he introduces. Behave, let's say, like delta to the minus one in which case the solution will exist by classical techniques, will exist only up to delta. But in order to get a trap surface, you, go to, you have to go all the way to one. So this is, a, this is not a local existence result. It has to be a global result. And in fact, Christodoulou proves 600 pages <laughs> to prove uh, that uh, these sort of things exist indeed for a long time. It's a, it's a very general result. Uh, and then in addition, he shows that if the data is sufficiently large, so, so this is a general result for, all for a general class of data. And then if in addition, uh, some kind of uniformity condition, so uniformity means uniformity in all directions here. If such a uniformity condition is verified, then you form a trap surface. Uh, you see the trap surface here, and you see the trap surface here. So you, 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 uh, he, he gives, first of all, a general result about this semi-global existence. And at the same time, these two conditions on the initial data under which you form a trap surface. Uh, and it has similar results of past non-infinity, but I won't talk about it. Finally, I guess that's the only other result I could talk about. Is this is a result of, uh, with uh, Luke and Rodniansky, which is uh, based on Christodoulou's result, but does something else, which in many ways is very unexpected. Uh, so. You see, his result was a result on, on, on initial conditions. You make an assumption on initial conditions. You assume that the initial conditions are uniformly large in some sense uh, in all directions. Right? Here, instead, I can assume that, uh, so in our result, you can assume that it, the initial data is Minkowskian everywhere except in an angle. So you just take a, a small angle in which you, you, you give a, a big pulse. Right? In the sense of Christodoulou. So you give a big pulse here, right? And you still, it, so the result says that it, no matter how small the angle is, if the data is sufficient, if the pulse is sufficiently large, you'll get a trap surface later on. But it's not a trap surface like here, which was based on a doubly null foliation. So it, it was sort of part of the construction in some sense. Uh, the, the, the kind of two surfaces that you, you, you get here, it's a two surface of intersection between, between, uh, a function u equal constant and a function u bar equal constant, which represent null hypersurfaces. Uh, and uh, right, so you can see it here. Right, so you have so th this hypersurface is exactly the intersection of this u equal constant, u bar equal constant, <coughs> with which you are using. So these are functions which you construct your space time. So you construct this portion. Uh, here, instead, this null hypersurface, you see, it's very wild. It looks very different. Uh, sorry, this trap surface. It's very well, it looks very different. And it's actually obtained by a deformation argument. So you have to combine Christodoulou's ingredients. Oops. <laughs> Maybe this oh, is, no. uh, shows me that I it's time to end. Cancel. Cancel. I did cancel, OK. How do I cancel? Ah, very good. There's nothing to do with trap surfaces, I hope. OK, so you see that. Uh, uh, again, in, in this technique, uh, you, you have to combine two things, a deformation argument and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the results, uh, the te technology of Christodoulou. So with this, maybe I'll stop. I have to talk about stability, but stability will be, will be my, my subject uh, tomorrow and, uh, and uh, on Wednesday.